Hello and welcome back. This is the week three lecture. So today I would like to finish our discussion of the coquette. Uh, I will keep this lecture relatively brief because I realize my week two lecture was quite long uh, and included a lot of information. So today I really just want to cover the second half of the novel. I just want to talk about a few key developments look at a couple of scenes and just think a little bit more about some of the uh, ideas or uh, generic conventions that we talked about a little bit last week. So I hopped on the discussion board uh, over the weekend just to take a look at what you guys were talking about and I was happy to see that some of you were discussing the epistolary form. That was one of my questions <laughs> but I was glad that you guys were engaging with that one. Um, because it is an interesting form. And again, it was common within the sentimental novel genre to have this epistolary structure. Some of Richardson's books were like that. Other sentimental writers uh, used the epistolary form. But it really creates an interesting reading experience. And some of you were commenting on that. So I wanted to just say a little bit more about that. Uh, today and also I was happy to see that a lot of you were discussing the complexity of Eliza as a character uh, again we don't necessarily have to find her sympathetic obviously some people do some people don't but she's complex she's that interesting mixture of sort of good and bad qualities like most humans <laughs> uh, so again some of you commented on how realistic the character might be and other characters in the text as well because we kind of have perhaps conflicting feelings about a lot of characters even Sanford who's pretty reprehensible on most levels some of you pointed out and I talked about this last week you know he does seem to have genuine regard maybe even love for Eliza he is a seducer he is a rake uh, but he seems to have more genuine feelings for her perhaps than Boyer uh, but of course he's looking for money in his marriage. So we talked about some of the confines that affect these characters. Obviously, Eliza is very constricted, as we talked about, uh, women during this period possessing very few rights. And of course, the memorable line from Davidson should be fresh in your minds when she says perhaps the big in the intro to the book, when Davidson says perhaps the biggest mistake Eliza makes is thinking that she can exercise freedom <laughs> when in reality she has no freedom. Uh, and perhaps that's what she comes to learn over the course of the narrative. So we left off last time with that sort of highly dramatic scene involving Boyer uh, and Sanford. So remember, Eliza is having a private conversation with Sanford out in the garden. Uh, Boyer sort of shows up unexpectedly. It turns out that she's actually planning to tell Sanford that she is go finally going to sort of commit to Boyer. But remember, she had promised Sanford that she would keep him posted <laughs> on the status of her relationship with Boyer. So Sanford even talks about this later how she felt kind of bound to him. She had made this promise and she felt like she had to keep her word. So, of course, he exploits that. He takes advantage of that. And it's easy to point to her decision and say, that's a mistake. You didn't owe him that. You didn't have to do that for uh, Sanford. But she generally tries to be accommodating and kind to most people, which perhaps at times gets her into trouble. So she sits down to talk with Sanford uh, and then Boyer shows up, sees the two of them alone together. He's scandalized. Uh, and of course, you know, they were planning on talking later that day. So he feels once again slighted. He storms out and he writes her off. He, he rejects her from that point on. So it's really kind of a turning point. Uh, like I said, it's roughly at the halfway point of the narrative. So we kind of stop there last time. So I won't cover everything that happens in the second half of the novel, but really the second half is kind of the story of deterioration. Uh, as Eliza's condition deteriorates, she deteriorates in a lot of ways. I want you guys to track this. Uh, on one level, her reputation suffers. And we mentioned that last week. You know, even Boyer even tells her that at one point. Says, you know, people are talking in town. Uh, we hear Selby kind of relay that information to Boyer in an earlier letter. This idea that people are gossiping about Eliza and Sanford because they spend a lot of time together and they seem to enjoy each other's company so her reputation is suffering uh but also like physically she seems to decline 
She loses a lot of her vivacity, uh, you know, her energy, uh, her wit, uh, her, her passion for writing. One interesting thing to note is that we hear less and less from Eliza as the narrative goes on. If you guys have finished the book, and I hope you, I hope that by the time you're watching this, you finish the novel because I will be revealing some spoilers. But you know, notice that we hear less and less from her as the book progresses. A lot of her experiences or actions are increasingly explained by other characters, uh, Julia, in some cases, and. Uh, you know, again, we hear less from Eliza, and she even says multiple times that she enjoys writing less. She derives less pleasure from writing than she previously had. So she becomes somewhat depressed after those events with Boyer that we looked at last time. But what's interesting is she kind of recovers, and then Sanford always comes along to sort of, you know, get her embroiled in another uh, difficult situation. So I kind of wanted to track some of those developments uh, in the second half of the book today, just kind of briefly. I want to look at one scene in particular, uh, a scene that I think is kind of pivotal, but it's easy to overlook it. It's kind of the moment where her resolution breaks, maybe for the final time, and she kind of ends up back in Sanford's orbit for the final time, and ultimately that will have disastrous Results, but I, I but first I want to go back to something that I meant to talk about last time, and I think I put this in the week two overview, but I forgot to mention it in lecture. So I want to go way back uh, to the early going of the novel. This is on page thirty-eight. Again, I hope you have my edition, and this is just a, a reminder that uh, Foster, the author, is very aware that she is working within the sentimental novel tradition. So if you watch the week two lecture, uh, you know that I've already spent a lot of time, probably too much time, talking about the history of the sentimental novel, and really just the history and kind of the development of the novel in general. But sentimental novels were some of the most popular early novels, and we certainly see that in the 1790s at the beginning of the early Republic period. So we mentioned The Power of Sympathy, we mentioned Charlotte Temple, two other best-selling sentimental novels that came out a few years earlier. Uh, a few years before The Coquette, and then The Coquette in 1797 is another popular uh, sentimental novel. But what we see here on page 38, this is a conversation between Mrs. Richmond and Eliza. And I, I meant to also mention the dialogue last time. I know it's a little difficult to read dialogue because, as you've noticed by now, Foster does not really use quotation marks, and she does not follow the modern convention uh, associated with dialogue of, you know, indenting and starting a new line each time a new character speaks, but you kind of get used to it. So this is an exchange between Mrs. Richmond and Eliza. They're talking about Sanford. And uh, basically, Mrs. Richmond is warning Eliza about the dangers of Sanford, but I want you to see how she describes him here. So first, this is Eliza talking. She says, I hope, madam, you do not think me an object of seduction." Uh, and the response from Mrs. Richmond, I do not think you seducible, nor was Richardson's Clarissa till she made herself the victim by her own indiscretion. Now, Mrs. Richmond goes on, pardon me, Eliza, this, meaning Sanford, is a second Lovelace. I am alarmed by his artful intrusions. His insinuating attention to you are characteristic of the man. So she's making a reference here to another sentimental novel. So I mentioned Samuel Richardson last time. Uh, he's an English writer who wrote some very popular sentimental novels, seduction narratives, much like this one, uh, several decades earlier, like in the 1740s, really helped to kind of establish the sentimental genre as we know it today. Uh, and one of his famous books is called Clarissa. So here, Mrs. Richmond is making a direct reference to an earlier, very popular, very famous sentimental novel, and she's specifically mentioning the rake or the seducer in that novel, whose name 
Lovelace, and she's saying Sanford is this guy. Like Sanford is the same type of guy. The way he's acting, the way he's insinuating himself into your presence, uh, that's all characteristic of this character. But this is kind of a meta moment uh, because Mrs. Richmond is explicitly referring to literature. So her way of explaining Sanford, who in this fictive universe is a real person, right? Her way of describing Sanford is to reference a literary character. And the assumption here is that everyone present, Eliza included, would be familiar with Richardson's novels. They would have been familiar with sentimental novels. They know what the rake character is like. Um, so that's why nobody has to really explain it all that much. I mean, they just tell Eliza that she should know better. There's this idea that Sanford's character is easily detected simply by reading other sentimental novels. And we hear at various points that Eliza does read novels. We don't necessarily know very much about what types of novels she's reading, but it's fair to say, fair to assume, that she's familiar with the genre. So the characters in this sentimental novel are also readers of other sentimental novels. So this is kind of a modern move that we might not necessarily expect from an author in the 1790s. But again, novels have always been kind of modern, and they've always been kind of metafiction. In other words, fiction about fiction. So remember I mentioned Don Quixote last week as an example of an early novel, not part of the English language tradition, but it only predates the coquette by about a century and a half. And I mentioned that it's very much that that novel is very much a comment on the dangers of reading old chivalric romances. And that's kind of what drives the protagonist crazy. Well, if you've read Don Quixote, you know that like in the second half of the novel, somebody writes a book about Don Quixote and his fateful sidekick Sancho and then they become sort of minor celebrities and then the author of the book becomes a character in Cervantes' novel. So again, it's kind of a commentary on fiction. Um, it's very modern. It surprises modern readers to kind of see that that's a part of novels from the very beginning uh, because they do come along later than other literary forms. So they're sort of able to take this all this sort of detached position and sort of comment on uh, cultural production while also being a cultural production. Uh, perhaps you find that interesting. So anyway, just be aware of that and be aware that Foster is clearly indebted to these earlier sentimental novels. She's working within a very recognizable form. But what's interesting about the epistolary uh, style is that and again, it wasn't uncommon in sentimental books, but one thing it does is it can sometimes make it sort of difficult for readers to form solid judgments. Because as I mentioned in the discussion board, we don't have a narrator to kind of walk us through things <laughs> uh, and maybe explain things to us. Instead, as you guys pointed out, we have these intimate conversations between characters. And that's really important. I'm glad you guys are thinking about that. And yeah, these are very revealing conversations because they're often between friends or confidants or in some cases between like even Eliza and her mother. Uh, so there's this high level of, of, of intimacy and trust. So these are the characters, you know, in these letters, the characters are often revealing very sort of, you know, important or very personal details about their lives and their feelings. Uh, and we sort of get to the core of who they are to a certain extent. But there's also this ambiguity because, uh, especially with Eliza, we, we hear less and less from her. So, uh, again, we, we get all these different voices. We don't have that narrator's voice to kind of center us. So you guys know if we have a, a third-person omniscient narrator to walk us through a narrative, we're going to get most of our information delivered in that voice, the narrator's voice. Now, of course, we'll hear other characters when we read dialogue, but a lot of the exposition, the narration of action, and maybe even the sort of value judgments that we're supposed to understand in regard to characters, a lot of that might get handed to us from a narrator even in a first person narrative uh, a first person point of view uh where maybe a character in the story is telling the story we still have a narrator's voice that we get sort of accustomed to and familiar with over the course of the book but we don't really have a narrator's voice here we just have a series of different characters voices and early in the book we hear a lot from eliza we hear her wit 
we hear her sort of gaiety, her, her love of life, her love of novelty and excitement and, you know, new experiences, essentially. And then we see the change as we hear less and less from her, as her spirits are obviously dampened and depressed. But we hear so many other voices, too. We hear from Lucy and Julia, friends of hers, who seem to be, you know, virtuous people, you know, upstanding citizens, but their relationships with Eliza are kind of complex. Um, and certainly there's a lot there for analysis. We hear a little bit from Eliza's mother. Uh, we certainly hear from some of the men in the text, uh, primarily Sanford, but also Boyer. We hear a little bit from Boyer's friend Selby. I don't think we ever hear from Charles, uh, the friend of... Uh, Sanford. Charles just receives letters <laughs> from Sanford. But, you know, we get male voices, we get female voices, and we get this wide spectrum. So we get some older people, we get sort of an established uh, sort of, uh, you know, matriarch of a family in Mrs. Richmond. And then we have younger figures, obviously, like Eliza. Lucy, I'm assuming, is Eliza's age. They're best friends, grew up together. Julia seems to be roughly in their peer group, but maybe a bit older. Um, so we learn a lot from different characters. Uh, but again, things get tricky late in the book because a lot of important things that happen to Eliza in the, in the, in the late chapters uh, will be revealed to us through other characters. So, you know, once her affair with uh, Sanford is sort of discovered by Julia, finally, Eliza kind of comes clean. But that's, as far as I can recall, that's all related to us in a letter written by Julia. And she's relating this exchange that she had with Eliza. So a lot of the, our understanding or knowledge of what happens to Eliza late in the narrative, they are mediated through these other characters, which matters. And it might, you know, have an impact on, you know, what we take at face value and how we view some of these relationships between the characters as the narrative Unfold. So I don't need to rehash uh, the plot. I think we basically know <laughs> what happens. But I do want to point to this really interesting scene. I think it's interesting. And then I'll just kind of wrap up with a few uh, summation comments. But if you guys could flip over. This is uh, letter 55, I believe, which should be on page uh, 117 in my edition. So this is kind of a... A brief moment, but I think it's pivotal because this is right after Eliza has learned that Sanford got married. Remember, Sanford's been gone for like a year, and she doesn't hear from him. She doesn't know what's going on, and then he comes back with a bride. He has married a wealthy woman because, obviously, he's in a bad state financially. But he doesn't say anything about this to Eliza, so she learns once he returns. Remember, he has moved to her, to Eliza's mother's, like, neighborhood. He lives near them now. He keeps putting himself in Eliza's path at virtually every juncture. But she's kind of sworn him off. So just a couple of uh, letters previous to this one, uh, she's writing to Lucy and she's saying, I'm, I'm done with him. Yeah, I'm, I'm no, <laughs> that's it. Uh, you know, I, I see what he is. Uh, I don't want anything to do with him. Uh, so now fast forward a few pages, a couple of letters later, she's writing another letter to Lucy and she's relating some recent events. And I just want you to notice what happens here uh, because there's kind of an opportunity for her to maybe swear off Sanford for good, but instead she kind of gets sucked back in to his orbit. But her mother and Julia are present at this pivotal juncture and they don't quite offer the support that maybe we would expect. So let's just take a look at this scene near the bottom of page 117. So uh, Eliza's sitting at home with her mom and Julia and they receive a billet or a letter announcing the presence of Sanford and he's requesting a conference with Eliza. This should sound familiar. He's done this before. So uh, she, she has the, you know, she's relating all of this to, to Lucy. Uh, I read the letter, the billet, and showed it to my mama and Julia. What, said I, shall I do? I wish not to see him. His artifice has destroyed my peace of mind, and his presence may open the wounds which time is closing. 
So she clearly doesn't want to see Sanford, and it sounds like she wants her mother or Julia to sort of confirm that the best thing to do is to refuse his request and not see him. But let's pay attention to what first her mom and then Julia say in response. Act, said my mama, agreeably to the dictates of your own judgment. Okay, well, that's not very helpful. She's basically just saying, do what you think is best, but just keep in mind, that's not necessarily bad advice, but just keep in mind that her mother was present for the previous drop by uh, by Sanford when Boyer showed up and there was the big dramatic scene and Boyer stormed out. Remember, Julia wasn't there for that, but the elder Mrs. Wharton was. Eliza's mother was there. She witnessed it all. Boyer even addressed her on his way out you know, as he stormed out so her mom knows uh some of the effects that could i mean again it's different now because boyer's out of the picture but it is strange that her mother doesn't have any strong opinions about seeing the man who at least indirectly destroyed eliza's chances with boyer but now pay attention to julia's response even stranger i see no harm in conversing with him said julia Perhaps it may remove some disagreeable thoughts, which now oppress and give you pain. And as he is no longer a candidate for your affections, added she with a smile, it will be less hazardous than formerly. He will not have the insolence to speak, nor you the folly to hear the language of love. Now, Again, we can sort of excuse Julia a little bit. She, she's just recently arrived at the Wharton residence, I believe. She doesn't yet know Sanford very well. Um, but, again, knowing what she knows, knowing about what's already happened to Eliza, this does strike me, at least, as rather odd advice. And she's at, le at the very least, she's just wrong. I mean, her assertion that uh, Sanford will no longer speak the language of love is wrong. He does later speak the language of love. Um, but also this idea that, oh, what's the harm in talking to him? Uh, maybe that's a fair position to take initially. But as we see, the conversation that ensues, there is harm that, t that, that results from this conversation. But I also just want to point to a small detail. Maybe you guys don't read it this way. But the point where Julia says, and as he is no longer a candidate for your affections, added she with a smile. I don't know how you guys read that. I read that as a little bit of mockery, perhaps. And I mentioned this last week. This might just be my reading, but others do read the book this way. This idea that Lucy and Julia are good friends and they do want what's best for Eliza, but they also regard her as a coquette. And they also feel like she doesn't always act properly, as we've already established. So I think you guys, if you're looking, you might be able to detect some moments in Lucy's letters and in Julia's letters where there might be a little bit of gentle mockery directed at Eliza. I think I mentioned how maybe we can see this from Lucy at times. But of course, uh, there are times when El Eliza is kind of gently mocking Lucy back. I actually like, I don't remember exactly what uh, point, oh, uh, well, there's some kind of witty exchange between the two where Lucy goes on this diatribe about how terrible Sanford is and then finishes her letter by saying, oh, I'm looking forward to seeing you, Eliza. You'll be a tonic for me or something. And then Eliza's response is, yeah, you need a tonic <laughs> after painting that portrait of Sanford. So they kind of poke gentle fun at one another in a way that we might expect from two longtime friends. But both Lucy and Julia, at least in my reading, can at times be a bit condescending, perhaps, to Eliza. They certainly think that they know better than Eliza, and maybe they do, uh, but they certainly criticize her decision-making. But there's also a sense that I get at moments, like this one, that they might even think that Eliza needs to be brought down a peg or two, because perhaps part of her problem is that she has a very large opinion of herself and uh, of her charms. And remember that passage we looked at last time from Lucy, where she's telling Eliza, basically, Boyer is the best you can hope for. Yes, you're beautiful and talented, but you don't have money. So this guy is pretty well established. He's a good, solid citizen. He's a good pick. You can't hope for any better. Uh, and your problem is you think that you can hope and find better.
So I think that's an opinion that Julia probably shares. <laughs> I think Julia and Lucy are probably united in that feeling. Uh, so we kind of see a shade of that here. Just a little bit of a reminder, maybe a little dig that, hey, Boyer's out of the picture. So now you can talk to Sanford. You shouldn't have talked to him last time, but now it's less hazardous. Maybe you can get some closure and move on. So maybe not bad advice, but what ensues is basically Sanford worming his way back into her world. So she takes a pretty hard line with him. If you look over on page 119, so he puts on this big show, he cries, uh, kind of begs her forgiveness, and she tells him, I forgive you and wish you happy, yet on this condition only, that you never again pollute my ears with the recital of your infamous passion. Yes, infamous, I call it. For what softer appellation can be given to such professions from a married man? So like Julia, she's kind of banking on this idea that he'll act better now because he's married. But of course he doesn't. And if they knew anything about these earlier seducers from sentimental novels, they should have known that he wasn't going to reform. And to her credit, Lucy does seem to know that. She says most rakes don't reform. Uh, don't hold your breath. So... Uh, but what happens here after she makes that demand of him and says, look, I forgive you, but you can't, you know, pursue me anymore like you have been. He agrees and he says, OK, let's just be friends and I want you to be friends with my wife because she's new in town and she doesn't know anybody. And Eliza says, OK. Well, she's kind of resistant at first. But remember, now Sanford lives nearby. So he starts to give all of these parties. He invites Eliza. She comes and she thinks that it might be appropriate now because he is married. Uh, so she kind of falls back into his orbit. She falls back into some of these old habits. Uh, so, you know, in, I think the very next letter, <laughs> she's back to praising him. Uh, but she also points out that she's finding it painful to mix with her old friends. She mentions in a letter to Lucy that she didn't go back to Boston with Julia to see some old friends because she can't really think of mixing with the gay multitude. Remember how much she enjoyed that early in the novel. Now her spirits are down and really the only person that she has fun with anymore is Sanford, which is an unfortunate position for her to be in. And in that same letter, she goes on to say that writing is no longer very agreeable to her. So this is a big change. Remember how full of wit and, and life and ideas she is early in the novel. She writes a lot. So again, we get her voice a lot early on. We really get to know her. But then late in the novel, as she deteriorates both physically, you know, mentally, perhaps morally, if you, if you read it that way, we hear less and less from her because she no longer wants to write. She's obviously depressed. Uh, and then just a few pages later on 131, we hear from Julia basically saying, I'm worried about Eliza. And Julia points out that Eliza's mind seems to be weakened. So again, there's this sense of mental deterioration, physical deterioration. She stops going out um, at times, she kind of becomes a recluse. She, she still associates with Sanford a bit, but she doesn't really want to mix with her old friends. And then just a little while later, I think it's on page 139 in a letter to Charles, we hear Sanford basically boast of finally succeeding, uh, which means that he has finally seduced her and they have commenced uh, an affair. Uh, but again, that, that happens relatively late in the narrative. And everything goes sharply downhill from that point on. She becomes pregnant. Uh, she eventually leaves her mother's house. Sanford kind of sets her up away from everybody so she can have the child in peace. It's obviously his child. Um, but she, of course, dies. So, you know, we have to make our final judgments about Julia. But it is interesting when we have to rely on letters. And we have to rely on all these different voices, a multitude of voices. So who do we trust? Do we trust Lucy and Julia and their judgment? Because, you know, to her credit, Julia sees pretty quickly just how toxic Sanford is. So she takes a much firmer stance in the, in the, in the following letters. But again, at that pivotal moment where Eliza was trying to resist him, she didn't get a ton of support. And I would contend that there are other, ports, other points in the narrative where she doesn't always get a lot of support. She gets lectures. She gets moral instruction from her elders, from her friends. I'm not sure if she always gets understanding and support because, frankly, Eliza's a bit different. 
than the other characters in the novel. She's different uh, from her friends. She's different than Mrs. Richmond, who is somewhat progressive in certain ways, uh, but she's the one who's comparing Sanford to the rake from that earlier sentimental novel. So, again, something Davidson mentioned, as bad as he is, as terrible as Sanford is, he does treat Eliza with a certain degree of seriousness. I wouldn't say respect, because he primarily is pursuing sex, but he does think that she's legitimately smart. He seems legitimately interested in her, interested in talking to her, associating with her, versus Boyer, who just seems to want her because she would be a nice addition to his social position. So she's in this difficult spot, and in the absence of clear instruction from Foster, it's really left to us to decide, okay, do we hold her responsible like readers of the time would have? Remember the harsh reaction to the real-life Elizabeth Whitman who died in this way, who had a similar downfall, and everybody was like, yeah, she had it coming. She should have known that that was how things were going to end. Do we read it that way, or do we read it through a, perhaps a more modern lens, or do we feel like Foster is offering commentary on the limitations and the real problems uh, facing women during this time at the beginning of our independent nation? Is this sort of social commentary disguised in a familiar sentimental epistolary package? You guys get to decide. So uh, wrap up the novel. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And next week, we will get started on Ruben and Rachel. If you're already finished with The Coquette around the middle of week three, I recommend getting started on Ralston's book because it is long. And I'll get you started uh, with some analysis next week. I will start talking about Ruben and Rachel in the week four lecture. So I'll see you then.